Welcome, uh, Dow and Brandon from Utah. This is uh, now, I think, our third or fourth week of doing these joint journal clubs. And this has become really a very exciting thing because we get to see folks from all over the country and uh, share with all the fellows from, I think now we have eight programs that are involved with this. So, uh, Dow and Brandon, we welcome you and uh, look forward to a great case discussion. And we'll have questions. And of course, all you guys will be lit up and when the questions come up, Linda will forward them to you on the messaging. So uh, let's get started and hope everybody is safe and well. All right, thanks a lot, thanks a lot Dr. Geyer. We're, um, we're really excited to be part of this as well. And, uh, and I just wanna introduce our crew here that we have from Utah. We have uh, Daryl Brykey, obviously. I think most people know him. Uh, we have also Nicholas Spina uh, and Ryan Spiker, who are also our partners here in Utah. Our fellows today are Robert Owen. He's from um, Wash U in St. Louis, uh, where he did his residency, and he's going to Atlanta next year into Peachtree Orthopedics. Uh, we also have Peter Shorten, also our fellow, who did his residency at University of Vermont and is moving on to private practice in Colorado Springs. And then finally, we have our chief resident, Travis Bailey, who will also be presenting today, um, who's going to do his spine fellowship next year in Emory. Um, so with that said, I think um, one of the other things that we're trying out on this journal club is some active and live polling. Um, I don't know if we have that slide or the number that we could show for here, right there. Here's, if you, if you um, when we do our active polling, um, if you could put this number into your phone now, it will make, uh, it'll make your voting easier later. Um, this is the number that you'll just uh, text the, the, your vote to, um, and we'll kind of see it coming up as uh, active and live uh, voting, which is uh, kind of a, cool uh, addition. So we have a, we threw in a couple questions there today just to kind of test it out today, but but I think it should add quite a bit to this and make it a little bit more fun and uh, interactive. Um, and then finally, do we have the agenda for today or, or, or are we just uh, starting out uh, with our first presenter? Um, and here is the um, agenda for today, which we're going to focus mostly on deformity and we're going to go through a couple of the um, uh, recent articles and uh, and some and one, a more classic normative article uh, more classic I should I say now it's classic uh, a couple of years old um, so with that said we'll get started uh, with uh, with Dr. Shorten uh, with his uh, first uh, as the first uh, presenter perfect thanks Dr. Lawrence thanks for having us um, we'll get moving on although I can't change the slides from my computer. If you say next slide, Pete, I can do it. Okay. So we're going to start with a, a case here. It's an 86-year-old female. She's uh, relatively healthy, but has had multiple years worth of low back pain, uh, some neurogenic claudication type symptoms, and a couple years worth of radicular pain, right, worse than left, mostly in an S1 distribution bilaterally. Really no uh, contributory past medical history or surgical history. She's pretty healthy. On her physical exam, her only real noticeable objective weakness is with hip flexion bilaterally. And part of that is probably breakaway due to pain. She's got some decreased sensation, L5 to S1 nerve distributions uh, on both sides, but otherwise a, a relatively normal exam. Here are her uh, preoperative radiographs. Uh, if you go to the next slide, Dr. Lawrence, I've got some measurements there for you. Your cob angle, she's got a, this degenerative scoliosis, some asymmetric collapse of four on five, and some lateral asthesis of three on four. Uh, and you can see the measurements there. The cob angle is 24, PI is 70. I'll let you, you take a look. So that's what we're working with um, at the, the onset of this. Next slide shows the MRI uh, with some respective cuts. And really no surprises here. At pretty much every level, she's got severe central lateral recess stenosis. I didn't put 5-1, but she's got the same findings uh, down at that level, as well as some foraminal stenosis at 5-1. So our, our plan going in here um, is to do an L2 to S1 decompression and infuse from one to her pelvis. And, and these are our post-operative radiographs. So she, was done a month, almost six to eight weeks ago at this point in time. Uh, and these are our, uh, our films at the end. Um, but overall, I, I, we were happy with it. She, was, she did well for a few weeks. You can go to the next slide. She did well for a few weeks. Um, and these are the comparison films. She went to the uh, 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 nursing facility 
And then she developed some increasing back pain, no new ridiculous symptoms or, or uh, findings in her legs, but really just back pain. And her family said that she started walking a little more hunched over. If you go to the next slide. This is what we found. Unfortunately, we didn't have scoliosis films um, prior, otherwise I would have included those. Uh, but these are what we found when she came back uh, about a month and a half after her operation. So as you can see, these screws in L1 have kind of cut through the end plate into the disc base at T12 L1. They haven't pulled out, but she's got about 40 degrees of local kyphosis at that level. Her sagittal alignment is certainly worse than what it was uh, prior to her original operation, as well as after her her um, her, her procedure. Um, and so here we are with the with our diagnosis. She's got PJF and, and an L1 compression fracture on top of it. Uh, um, and we're going to ask a couple of questions here before I get into a uh, our, our article. Here's our active polling. So here's the question. Who do you consider the most important radiographic measurement that you attempt to correct in the surgical treatment of a patient like this? <clears throat> Either the T1 pelvic angle, SVA, pelvic tilt, PIL mismatch. Great. Inter interesting. Interesting. The sort of the classic, uh, the classic parameters. Great. Great. Go forward. And then we'll talk uh, very briefly about the, my article. This is the, the article from the ISSG. Really, the, the goal of this was to um, determine whether or not uh, patients with ASD and compared to, to a cohort of asymp asymptomatic patients, if we need to be considering um, uh, certain pel spinal pelvic parameters uh, like PI, as well as age in terms of uh, determining how much correction we, we should be going for. Perfect. Um, and so in this study, uh, it's a retrospective analysis of the data from, from multiple groups. And uh, those that were within the ASD cohort had any one of these four particular radiographic parameters. So anyone over the age of 18 with one of those fell into this category. And what they then did is, is they compared outcomes um, the ODI, the SRS-22, and the SF-36 relative to um, the, uh, uh, these certain parameters. Uh, and what they did is they, they correlated them based on those radiographic, but then also based on the outcomes themselves. And they had almost 1,000 patients in the ASD and 111 in the asymptomatic cohort. And the, the paper, as you've all seen, is full of different charts. Um, that you really need to sort of scour. But the point being, the most important point being is that the, the PI, when you factor that into the calculations for the optimal alignment, um, there's a, a tremendous amount of variability in what is considered to be a good outcome uh, or the high functional status. And so just for instance, um, if you had a, a elderly patient, 74 years old, were older and had a low PI, you're looking at, at having their uh, T1 pelvic angle around 12, as opposed to somebody who's an, in that same age group with a very high PI, your, your T1 uh, pelvic angle is almost you know 34. And so there's a tremendous uh, amount of variability there um, between uh, uh, when you consider these uh, pelvic parameters uh, in your calculations. And so what they ultimately concluded was that uh, something that we already knew, uh, you know, you have to consider SVA, you have to consider uh, in these older adults that, that you don't want to be as aggressive. Um, their functional outcomes won't be uh, what they would in a younger cohort necessarily. 
Um, and it also reaffirmed the idea that the PI and other uh, pelvic parameters are, are, are very important um, and must be considered and adjusted based on age and, and, uh, uh, and their preoperative status. And so it's something that, that I think isn't necessarily new, but I think it demonstrates uh, in a very concise way with those charts exactly what, you're, what you should be aiming for, hopefully preoperatively. So now we're going to ask a couple questions two here. I don't know where the player we are. So do you routinely consider these age-defined parameters and factor them into your preoperative surgical plan? Good. All right. So, um, is that the end of the presentation, Pete? No, we I, we had one more question, and then I was we were just going to show them what we did afterwards. Okay. This is the last question that we have. So, what augments or alterations in your fixation method do you use at the top of your construct to attempt to mitigate the risk? Great. Okay, I think we can head back to the, the finale here. So our surgical plan, um, again, these were her preoperative films. Our, our plan was to do a revision T10 to, to pelvis uh, and T12L1 SPO, uh, get her alignment a little bit better. And this is what she ended up with. Um, you can see her uh, sagittal alignment is, is improved. Her PIL mismatch is also improved, uh, but the other parameters uh, more or less remain the same. And there's a comparison before and after. And that's it, Dr. Lawrence. Great. Um, well, was, uh, there's been some interesting questions um, coming through uh, as we've been um, sort of discussing this case, and uh, we've tried to answer some of them al along the way. Um, there were a couple, a couple uh, things I think that came up with some of the questions with um, and the polling. Uh, one is the the age deformity um, characteristic, the the characteristics of um, calculating your correction based on age. Um, I think most people at this point said yes, but there were there was a, a group of people that said um, that said no. Um, in our experience at Utah, we we have found that um, really uh, trying to figure out uh, better calculations for deformity correction based on age has been uh, quite helpful for us um, for our outcomes, um, as well as decreasing our proximal junctional failure rates. Um, and so I think that's why the, the this article has been so so informative and, and really changed um, a lot of deformity practices. Um, the other question that came up along the way um, was a question about um, bone quality uh, and DEXA scans. Uh, we will routinely um, get DEXA scans in patients that are high risk. Um, oftentimes we do send them to our bone metabolism specialist and, and potentially uh, try to do some improvements in bone health prior to surgery. Um, uh, the the there's a lot of nuances that go along with uh, bone density scans in these in these deformity patients, especially as they get sclerotic end plates. Oftentimes, you're fooled with these DEXA scans. Um, so even though they are an important part of treating deformity patients, you you have to be careful with the results of them as well. Um, and then um, the uh, uh, other uh, question that was interesting as well was what people are using in their in the proximal end of their constructs for prevention of proximal junctional failure. 
Um, and, uh, and I think, um, I think that that's a, that's a topic that we could all talk about and debate for a while. Um, but, um, but good job, Pete. Uh, any other comments from, um, from anybody else, Dr. Brocky? Sorry, it took me a little bit to get my microphone turned on. I think it was an uh, excellent presentation and, and great comments uh, amongst the uh, group. Thank you for uh, participating. Um, I think DEXA is a, is a or bone density is is a challenging topic to really get our heads around because we don't really have a, a good known cutoff. We use two, two minus two point five obviously as a as a known osteoporosis uh, uh, increase fracture risk uh, and apply that or attempt to apply that to this patient population. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, it appears to be a uh, uh, more complicated than than simply bone density. That said. We use a DEXA regularly, and we try to work on bone density pre-op uh, as well as nutrition on, on all of these patients. The risks are just too high not to. Um, regarding uh, overall alignment, uh, we definitely take age into consideration, and we're not aiming for uh, normal in an older patient population. We're aiming for, or at least not normal for, for the younger population. We're aiming for somewhat close to normal in the older population, and that's really an important uh, difference to pay attention to. Um, I don't have a lot more to add. I think you guys did a great job. Thank you. One of, one of the questions that just came through from uh, Dr. Chapman was, so should we intentionally undercorrect older patients? I think um, I think that I think that that might be uh, a little a little a little of an aggressive uh, statement. I think um, I think what we try to say is is that we're not going to correct them as much as we used to. Um, we should. We shouldn't, we shouldn't intentionally undercorrect, but we shouldn't go over the top to overcorrect. I think, I think that's kind of the point a little bit of this. And um, I, think, uh, I think that's sort of where we're, the kind of the way we think about it. And we don't try to make these patients look perfect. Jens, comment, you're on there, I can see you. I was just trying to be facetious, thank you, the usual. <laughs> Izzy, Izzy brought up the the point that the um, on the post op films uh, uh, pelvic tilt not fully uh, corrected, and I I actually find it sometimes I, I we always try to manage both the uh, alignment and uh, that we can measure uh, in the thoracolumbar spine the L uh, P I L mismatch and add in the pelvic tilt as part of the deformity. Uh, but I find it's in a lot of patients postoperatively, it's hard to get them to stand normally for a while, either because their their hip flexors are tight, which we work on aggressively uh, to try and stretch, or because their set point is forward and they're used to standing uh, in a certain alignment. And we're working constantly on trying to get them to stand straighter. So uh, it's not so uncommon to see uh, pelvic tilt slowly improve rather than rapidly improve right after a, a surgery. Okay, great. So let's move on to the next um, the next uh, presentation. Okay. Uh, good morning, and I'd uh, just like to echo Pete's comments and uh, thank you to the Seattle Sound Science Foundation for helping us to set this up. Uh, so this is our second case uh, patient presented with a chief complaint of bilateral leg pain. Uh, she's a 75-year-old female presenting with right greater than left leg pain and right leg weakness. Her symptoms were consistent with an L4 and L5 radiculopathy, with her right leg giving out, causing multiple falls, and a decreased walking capacity. Past medical history listed here, she also underwent an unspecified prior lumbar kythoplasty. On her examination, her right lower extremity had decreased sensation in the L4 and 5 distributions and four to five strength with quadriceps, tibialis anterior, and EHL. This is a presenting uh, AP image demonstrating a degenerative lumbar scoliosis with significant osteopenia. You can also appreciate the cement in the L2 vertebral body from her prior kyphoplasty. There's some lateral listhesis of L4 on L5. And in addition, there's a pretty significant uh, curve in this patient with a primary curve from L2 to L4 of 31 degrees and then a fractional curve 
of 14 degrees. And moving to the lateral image, you can see these final parameters listed to the right with a pelvic incidence of 67, total lumbar lordosis of 44 degrees, leading to a mismatch of 23 degrees and a pelvic tilt of 27 degrees. So you can again appreciate the cement uh, present in the L2 vertebral body. This is uh, selective uh, axial cuts of an MRI demonstrating an L2-3 significant right greater than left-sided lateral recess stenosis. At L3-4, more bilateral lateral recess and some central stenosis at that level, similar bilaterally at L4-5. And then as we progress to L5-S1, things start to open back up. So in this case, uh, this is a patient with a degenerative lumbar scoliosis, lumbar spinal stenosis, and lumbar radiculopathy. I should also mention that full scoliosis views did not demonstrate anything surprising in this patient above. And so that will lead to our next poll question. So the question is really what is, uh, based on this patient's presentation, your preferred treatment option, kind of from a more global picture. An MIS-based approach with multiple interbodies, percutaneous screws, um, a more selective lumbar fusion, an open decompression, or a larger thoracolumbar fusion uh, with an open decompression and possible fixation to the sacrum or pelvis. So about a third with um, laterally lateral-based approaches. It's good. A quarter. Now a quarter, yeah. Go ahead, buddy. Okay, um, and then I just need, there we go, thanks. So that leads to the second article, which is a article out of the AO Spine Organization with the ISSG looking at a treatment of fractional curves in deformity patients with uh, scoliosis and uh, comparing MIS approaches versus traditional open surgery and looking at surgical outcomes. And just as a brief background, uh, foraminal collapse in these fractional curves in scoliosis patients is a frequent cause of radiculopathy and leading these patients to ask for surgery. And the thought of why this is maybe poorly tolerated is that this up-down stenosis results from the concavity of the curve in addition to other factors that leads to a more mechanical compression at the level of the dorsal root ganglion, which tends to be refractory to conservative management. And treatment of the fractional curves can really be critical to improving these patients' pain and having good results. And traditionally, these have been treated with open laminectomies and foraminotomies, but with MIS, um, coming into play, indirect decompression has become more popular. And so their objective, again, was to compare the outcomes of MIS versus open treatment of these fractional curves. And so the methods, uh, this was a retrospective multi-center review of ASD patients with a minimum two-year follow-up. And you can see the inclusion criteria of at least a 10-degree fractional curve with greater than three levels of instrumentation, and then at least one of the spinal parameters listed below. And then they then also performed a matched analysis where uh, this was performed by the total number of levels fused. We'll get into that a little more on the next slide. Uh, the primary outcome was improvement in vast leg pain, but they also looked at fractional curve correction, ODI, and other spinal parameter corrections. There were 118 patients, 79 treated with traditional open surgery, 39 with MIS. They all had similar preoperative fractional curve uh, as far as magnitude. And they all, if you combine the entire group, there was a similar post-op fractional curve correction between groups. You can see the numbers listed to the right. Um, the unmatched analysis showed that MIS actually had greater vast leg pain reduction. But if you look right above that, the average number of levels treated was more than double in the open group. And so because of that, the real bulk of this study is in the matched analysis where they matched based on number of levels treated an average of seven levels, and they had 20 patients in each group. And again, these cases showed similar correction of the fractional curve magnitude and similar improvements in vast leg pain, despite the open group having more open posterior decompressions. Uh, the MIS group, of course, uh, had more interbody fusions versus only 
about a third in the open group and less blood loss in the MIS group. The open group fused more often than the pelvis and noted a higher change in the SVA. There were no other significant differences. In the discussion, they really focused on the fact that despite there being significantly fewer open posterior decompressions, when they looked at their primary outcome of vast leg pain uh, treated with MIS compared to open, there was a similar reduction in that pain. And so their argument is that indirect decompression and ligament ataxis may be as effective at improving leg pain uh, from the fractional curve as traditional open surgery. It also showed similar overall magnitude of correction, sort of leading this to uh, show MIS as a possible option for management of these ridiculous symptoms due to the fractional curve. And it may be as effective as open surgery. So that brings us back to our case uh, and sort of similar with the poll, we opted for a selective lumbar decompression infusion uh, with an L2 to 5 laminectomy and a 1 to 5 fusion. And here are the post-operative images, scoliosis views, uh, demonstrating a significant correction in the main and fractional curves. And these are the pre versus post-op uh, sagittal parameters and the low lumbar lordosis and lumbar lordosis numbers are flipped post-op, but there was a improvement in the mismatch to about 18 degrees. Other parameters were similar post-operatively. And on the coronal views, you can see pretty much in line with the findings of that paper on average, about a 10 degree correction, the fractional curve and 20 degrees of the primary curve. And that's the conclusion of that case. Well, thanks, Bob. That was a great, great presentation. I think that that article really brings out a lot of salient points in regard to um, treatment options and ways to do uh, different ways of doing different things. Um, uh, the questions that we had along the way um, was the uh, concept uh, uh, from Dr. Chapman, the concept of uh, indirect decompression. Um, you know, the 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 point that he brought up with indirect um, decompression and relying on uh, our instrumentation and hardware to um, not su not have any uh, any subsidence um, which would then uh, lead to recurrent or um, a recalcitrant uh, uh, stenosis um, and I think that that's a really good um, I think that that's a really good point I think that's a really good uh, aspect of 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 why you need to kind of change your surgical approaches, but depending on um, exactly uh, the right thing for the patient. And so that's a, that's a great point, and, and I couldn't agree with, with that more. I, I guess I would add, I think we've been trying to uh, uh, do less in the do less is more uh, thought process over the last uh, several years, uh, really an attempt to decrease the postoperative complications, parks industrial failure being the number one. And so understanding when and where we can get away with uh, more limited surgery is absolutely key. And I think we learn more each year about this issue. One comment that I'd like to bring up is that uh, in the MIS group, uh, even though it is um, MIS and the blood loss is substantially lower, they still had a 50% transfusion rate postoperatively. So these surgeries, I think, are big no matter which way you do them. Um, it's just which way is uh, uh, less big. I... If I can add a comment in there as well. Uh, one of the things that's forgotten, and I put it up in the chat, is the concept of particular kinking of the DRG that Ian McNabb described probably 40 or 50 years ago now. And you look at the films, you can see the up-down stenosis on the concavity of the fractional curve, but we forget about the pedicle above and the nerve root coming around the corner and being stretched as the spine lysthesis to the side. And that just speaks to the importance of deformity correction when we are looking at these cases with the fractional curves. So you can do your decompression, but if you don't get the deformity correction, you're still going to get the particular kinking, which sits right on top of the DRG. And a lot of these patients end up with more substantial discomfort or prolonged discomfort. Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great point. 
it's a it's, it's an article that often often uh, is is forgotten about. Jens asked uh, asked about uh, distal augmenting fixation when you stop at L5, and yet I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. We have uh, experienced both the uh, successes and tragedies of stopping at L5, uh, and um, uh, generally would prefer to not go to the pelvis if we can help it. Uh, uh, again, due to the increased risk of proximal, proximal junctional failure. Uh, but L5 is a, is a touchy vertebrae to stop at at times, particularly for a longer construct. So what, what are your thoughts on that? I don't, I don't know is the answer. It's a really problematic issue. Um, obviously, we are probably far more going into the pelvis in postmenopausal females. And uh, of course, the failure point has been simply moved up rosterly wherever we stop there, and uh, we still don't have a great answer for it. Uh, but um, this is just empirical. I've just seen way too many females falling apart. And as you all know, I have a great sensitivity about cements. Uh, so um, I see more cements used. And I think that if we stop at L5 in a very osteopenic looking patient, like the one case that you showed, um, that may become more necessary because the disabling nature of L5 collapses um, is pretty hard to correct and um, uh, very disabling. They usually have foot drops and are pitched forwards quite a lot. So I'm like you, not aware of a clear answer, but just uh, unsupported screws at L5 are probably uh, going to fall apart in an older patient. Thank you. Yeah, and it's interesting as we've tried to do less and less, um, you know, that exact, uh, you, you know, for this patient we won, um, but we could have the same patient tomorrow that we could lose on. Um, and that's a really good point, trying to figure out who, who, who those patients are that can tolerate stopping at L5 and who are those patients that can't is the really difficult, uh, really difficult part of this, and um, one that we're currently trying to trying to trying to figure out. Um, you know, how much correction can they tolerate? You know, what what is a bone min mineral density sort of threshold? Uh, there's so many so many variables that go into it that that it's 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 hard. Um, any other any other questions uh, comments? Uh, otherwise, we'll move on to our last article. All right, Travis. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence. All right. Okay, so we're going to start with the case as well. Uh, this is a 66 year old male who was entered at Dr. Lawrence's clinic uh, back in 2017. Uh, came in with a main complaint of back pain with a little bit of uh, ridiculous symptoms due to his bilateral buttocks with any prolonged walking. He has a past medical history, is significant for ischemic cardiomyopathy. You can see his, his uh, sternal wires present. Not sure why it's changing screens here. All right, um, also has alcoholism and um, active prostate cancer. So on exam, initial presentation, he is uh, intact in his bilateral lower extremities without any significant deficits. As you can see on his AP and lateral radiographs, um, he has a significant uh, lumbar scoliosis, about 35 degrees, as well as uh, associated kyphosis and lateral radiograph. <clears throat> a couple of radio uh, representative images from his MR, um, which are his most severe levels at L3, L4, as well as L4 or five. So, as you would expect, uh, significant central and lateral recess stenosis. And so this is a gentleman who, after a lengthy conversation um, with us, as well as our PM and our colleagues, um, and through a multidisciplinary approach, uh, elected non-operative treatment out of the bat, out of the gate, and I underwent RFA, selective nerve root injections, and is able to tolerate those well. And overall, <clears throat> and after our initial consultation, he was happy with his spine health. And thus we uh, elected to continue non-operative treatment. I'm not sure why we keep Somebody, losing. Somebody's got control of the slides. Um, and here, I'm, I'm advancing them again, Travis. Okay. If you want, I can just say next. I'm not sure what's happening. Yeah, perfect.
So with uh, this gentleman's case, um, like I said, we elected non-operative treatment at this point in time <clears throat> after our initial presentation. Uh, and now, the, now the slides are gone. To discuss today is uh, a randomized trial uh, that came out in 2019, uh, looking at those patients with adult lumbar scoliosis um, and deciding and deciphering whether or not uh, they are better treated with non-operative versus operative intervention, as you can see here. Next. Um, so as we know, adult spinal deformity, it affects up to 15% of our population, and its associated disability is similar to that of a chronic disease such as diabetes or rheumatoid arthritis. And like I said, the clinical question we have is, is there a difference in patient reported outcomes between the operative and non-operative treatment of adult uh, lumbar scoliosis? Next. So this is a multi-center randomized controlled trial. Um, notable inclusion criteria was any patient 40 to 80 years of age with no previous spinal fusion or multi-level decompression. So um, relatively virgin uh, with regards to um, spinal procedures. They had to have a Cobb angle greater than 30, an ODI greater than 20, or an SRS subscore less than four, with their primary outcomes being an ODI and SRS 22 at the two-year follow-up. And so they randomized back yeah, I don't know what's happening again, Travis, sorry. So they, they ended up randomizing about 63 patients into um, the randomized cohort, 30 underwent operative intervention, 33 underwent non-operative, and then their observational cohort had about 100 in each group. And what I really want you to look at here is this bottom row, <clears throat> and what it shows is of the randomized cohort, 31 completed their two-year follow-up, but at their two-year follow-up, 31 of the patients, or 31 of the patients who were supposed to be non-operative treated, 64% ultimately crossed over and underwent uh, operative intervention. Um, if you look at the observational cohort, those numbers are better. We're only 13% switched groups and underwent uh, an operation, uh, which really guides the treatment or guides the um, way we can interpret this paper moving forward. And so next. So if we look at the intention of treat analysis, which is imperative when anytime we're looking at a randomized controlled trial, what you can see by the uh, yellow circle on both the ODI and SRS um, graphs is that at one year, there was a greater improvement in the operative versus non-operative cohorts uh, with regards to uh, outcomes of the ODI and, ODI and SRS 22. However, if you look at the red box, you can see that by two years, that difference dissipates and they're no longer significant. Next. If we look at the as treated analysis, what you can see is there is a difference at both the one year time point as well as the two year time point in regards to the ODI and SRS 22 for the operative intervention. Next. The responder analysis looking at those patients who um, underwent operative versus non operative and those uh, subset of patients who were able to meet the MCID for the ODI and SRS 22 showed a significant difference with regards to both the operative and non operative groups for each variable evaluated at least with regards to the as treated. Next. And the final point that we really need to look at, um, especially when we're talking about any operative intervention, is the amount of serious adverse events. And what, you can, what we saw in this group was there are 114 serious adverse events in the operative cohort, nine neurologic deficits, four were at least in HSC, and one patient died from it. Um, and of the uh, surgeries performed, 24 reserve vision surgeries were necessary. But what I do want to point out is that even if you had a serious adverse event and you're in an operative cohort, you still had um, an, a more significant improvement with regards to SRS 22 and ODI as compared to those patients who are in the non-operative cohort. Next. And so in conclusion, it's difficult, um, especially when we look at this uh, intent to treat analysis with due to substantial non-adherence to the assigned cohort. Yet, I think if we draw our conclusions simply off of the ASTRID analysis and the MCID, it does show uh, benefit to surgical intervention. Noting that there is a high rate of serious adverse events, as we know in any spinal deformity uh, case, um, those patients who are overall happy with their spine health upon initial presentation, like our gentlemen who are presented at the beginning, um, I think it is reasonable to continue non-operative care. Um, he is now three years out. Uh, he is continuing to uh, meet with us as well as our PMNR colleagues, um, and he's been happy with his level of, of function. Yet, I do think we can uh, say that if the patient fails non-operative treatment, um, they're overall unhappy with their spine health, that operative intervention uh, provides significant benefit. Thank you. <clears throat> Great, nicely, nicely done, Travis. Um, 
you know, this is one of those interesting, uh, interesting articles that, um, and, and a very well done article. This, this, this patient that I've, that I've been following over the years, it's actually, I've been seeing him for much longer than that, probably closer to 10 years. Um, this is a patient who initially had uh, uh, thought about a deformity and spine reconstructive procedure. And um, given some of his history, I sent him for a stress test. And, and I don't know about uh, some of the relationship you guys have with your cardiologist, but one of our card cardiologists, I would, his nickname was Full Metal Jacket because he would put a stent in anything. And, um, and he called me afterwards and said, you know, th thankfully you sent this guy to me because he would have died for sure. Um, and so he ended up having a five vessel cabbage and you could see what happened with him. But, but after that point, his, his operative uh, capabilities were, were, were largely um, minim, you know, minimalized after that. But, he, uh, but he's done quite well with non-operative treatment. Um, I think a lot of it is education, expectation management, um, as well with um, some of our non-operative uh, options as well with RFAs and injections. But, but he's done quite well with his, with his non-operative treatment. And I think this article is... Um, is a, is a great addition to our, to our literature. And I, and I thought that's why we should sort of talk about it quite a bit. Other, other thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree. I'm glad this is Ryan Spiker, University of Utah. Um, I agree. I'm glad we included it. Um, the one question that then comes up, the, the kind of natural progression is, well, what non-operative treatments should we offer? And I think that's a, a tricky field to enter as surgeons, because we're talking these people out of surgery often because um, they just want to get fixed. We explain the risks and benefits, decide to pursue non-operative treatment, and then we're a little bit flying blind. There's there's not a ton of literature when we look at, you know, facet injections and stimulators and all these procedures that are done. Um, so I'd love maybe a lot of the people that are, that are on the panel here today to kind of comment maybe about how they manage that. I'll, I'll chime in with a couple comments <clears throat> on this. Uh, one of the cautions that I will um, tell or say about the paper that we just uh, heard. We're relying on the SF36s, on the ODIs, on the SRS22s. And despite the fact that we consider those objective, they're really not objective. And the patients may be perceiving less pain. They may be more comfortable, but are they truly stressing themselves as much? Are they truly functioning as much? And that's where I think we really need better functional outcome measures. And, and I can't resist but put a plug in for gait analysis on this. Uh, we found a lot of differences in our adult scolies where they are functioning much better, yet their uh, outcome scores, their patient reported outcome scores don't necessarily reflect the level of function. And we've also seen the reverse of that. So there's still a lot to learn and to look at in terms of the patient function in there. Uh, one of the other cautionary notes that I'll, I'll mention, uh, uh, Ryan, you mentioned spinal cord stimulators. Uh, people are considering that a non-operative treatment. It's not a non-operative treatment. It's still an operation to get it in. And when it doesn't go well, when it gets infected, when there's a neurologic deficit, it becomes an even worse issue. So. Let's not lump spinal cord stimulators in with non-operative treatment. Is he, just to follow up, uh, is he just to follow up on your comment real quickly? Uh, I totally agree with you regarding the outcome scores and the question is specific to uh, functional changes that the patient has gotten used to and may not complain about in particular. Uh, I, my question is more philosophical. What do you do about that? Is that okay? Is it okay for a patient to decrease their functional status if they're satisfied with that? I would wonder, yes, uh, and we should be sort of following their uh, their uh, satisfaction with management of non-operative treatment. And to follow on Jens's most recent question in the chat room, uh, stenosis and radiculopathy tend to be reasons to drive us potentially to the operating room even more so than the deformity or the activity level in and of itself. So that ends up being a marker for the pain and problems that a patient has. But just a follow-up comment from you on that. So, yeah, I, I would agree that we need to listen to the patient. If the patient's satisfied with non-operative care, if they're not fussed that they can no longer walk around the block, we shouldn't be operating on them. The, 
the risks outweigh the benefits to that patient. But we still see a lot of patients that come to us and they're 80, 85 year old and they, they tell us, I don't want to look and act like I'm 90. I want to be like I'm 60 again. So we have to tailor it to what the patient wants, but we still have to make sure we're doing the right operation for the right reasons with the right outcome. And relying just on the patient reported outcome measures, I think we're misleading ourselves a little bit. Thanks again, Paul. Uh, first of all, I, I totally agree with Izzy that uh, the current generation of outcome scores does not reflect uh, what really goes on with patients and biometrics are the next frontier. And kudos to you and your Gate Lab for new insights. The uh, point that I want to make to Dr. Spiker's comment is that we are obviously surgeons, but I think that we're making a grave mistake by not owning the non-operative care component. So all these uh, very complex cases that were shown today and the great articles that were selected underscore uh, for me the fact that A, we should uh, be the ones to control uh, and get to know these patients. These are rarely urgent surgeries. These are usually things where we can install what we call a prehab process nowadays. And uh, we should really kind of have an iterative process. But the key point here is that we should be the ones to control this, not a psychiatrist, not a pain specialist. Uh, they should serve at our um, uh, disposition and uh, based upon our wisdom. So. My pitch is basically we should be not just spine surgeons, but spine physicians also be willing to have a long-term relationship with these patients uh, preoperatively before we then engage in a well-chosen surgery. Thank you. Yeah, th thank you for that comment. And that's kind of what I was getting at. Some of these patients get sent out and um, end up having 15 injections and a spinal cord stimulator and they go through this pathway that's, that's quote, non-surgical that I think is very dangerous and and is not in their best interest. Um, and that's why I was kind of posing the question. So yeah, I appreciate that and, and agree. I think, uh, you know, the six month follow-up visits kind of indefinitely are, are a good use of time and really can help these people significantly. Just one comment. I think From that- Hamill, can I yeah, ask another question? Sorry, oh, go ahead, Rick, I'll, I'll, I'll let I, you come. Yeah, just a real simple comment. I think that what Dr. Chapman said was very, very important because as Ryan just said, these patients get sent to pain management and they do whatever they want. I, I'm amazed that many times I'll send a patient out for a specific nerve block and they come back later and they've had, you know, a four nerve block, a five nerve block. They've had facet injections. They've had rhizotomies and everything else. So the thing is they act independently and they're not doing really what we need diagnostically to try to figure out what's best for them. So... You know, I agree with Dr. Chapman. It's a really important point for everybody. I was going to bring up a separate uh, issue just based on the fact that we're, we're also in a journal club assessing uh, how we read the literature. And uh, one of the issues that this last article brings up is the uh, specific issue that we see a lot on as treated versus uh, versus intention to treat analyses. Uh, Fortunately, we're able to see both in this, and sometimes the uh, the editorial process has knocked out the as treated analysis in operative versus non operative care in some journals. And uh, many of you have done uh, uh, very sophisticated analyses of your of your uh, large cohort studies, and would really like to hear your thoughts on the way to analyze operative and non operative uh, cohorts in this kind of a study because I, I struggle with the standard editorial request of uh, intention to treat and uh, would love to hear your comments. Uh, yeah, Daryl, I, I struggle with that. I'm not an epidemiologist, but it kind of seems intuitive. If you get an operation, you should be analyzed in the operative group. If you don't get an operation, you should be analyzed in the non-operative group. Uh, that's where you're gonna get the true outcome at six months, at one year and at five years. Uh, if you add to, to that, then uh, the um, the points are very uh, salient. First of all, I do think uh, we have to reconsider whether the PRCT is truly the best uh, form of research model for surgical treatments. From purely a philosophical standpoint, any patient who is in a non-operative arm who crosses over into a surgical arm later uh, is a failure of non-operative treatment, and I always 
uh, whether it's in the sport trials or in the other trials that basically have had these great numbers of crossovers, uh, am amazed that this fact is not basically highlighted right off the bat. So a crossover from a non-operative group is a treatment failure of non-operative care and not a crossover. So that's a uh, a glossing over in linguistic terms that I think we should uh, uh, kind of rectify. Uh, in terms of uh, what's better data and over the large uh, perspective, the long game is obviously outcomes, as Izzy said, five to 10 years from now, and trying to track what patients do. And obviously our insurance carriers and government agencies will also hold up in front of us the visor of reoperation. Of, um, of surgery. So, so big data will become a very big factor in how we will receive permission for surgeries in the future. Thank you. Jens and Daryl, I have a question for you guys. So you've been involved with the uh, scoliosis study group and you have produced wonderful uh, data. And I, I seem to recall Chris Ames publishing something on AI. And just like some of the cases we talked about with the patient, as you said, Daryl, the problem is, do you fuse to the sacrum? Do you just fuse to L5? I think that as we get more and more data, hopefully we'll be able to use uh, predictive analysis to figure out which patients are going to get these problems because it, it is frustrating. You do the same operation. They don't get a uh, PJK. You do the same operation, another patient, and they develop in a matter of you know weeks to month. So where are you guys with that? And uh, again, I, I give you kudos for all the work that Jens and Daryl and everybody else that's been involved with that group. Let, let me deflect. I see Patrick Johnson with a cool baseball cap on there. Maybe Dr. Johnson can tell us what they do in LA because they've done some very nice things. What's that NFL thing? I, I remember that faintly in the past. It's a very <laughs> and why the color red, Patrick? Can you explain that you're in LA? Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, okay, great. No, I've been listening to this, and I'm very fascinated by, you know, just the whole concept of, you know, we have a lot of patients, we all do, all of us, the guys that are here on this panel, that we don't operate on. And, and I'm not necessarily agreeing that crossing over is a failure. I mean, that's a progression of the natural history of a patient's problem. And, and, and I'm just dropping little tidbits here. And then, and then when uh, Rick was bringing up this idea about how do you use predictive analysis, um, you know, we can't predict the future because it's like, look at the world we're living in right now. I mean, there's a lot of things that we can't predict. How come we can't use some of the past patients that we've had? And, and I'm just going to use an example here right now is that I saw a lady that, um, uh, she sent me her films and I just sent her to Daryl Brodkey. She was operated on for a lumbar scoliosis in the 1960s. And she did well for literally 50 years. So why can't we look backwards as well as forwards with predictive analysis to say, hey, here's a patient that was very, very successful. And her story is she had, I believe it was like a uh, T9 to L4 fusion. And she lasted 50 years and she's finally wearing out those subjacent segments that weren't fused. And, and I, I think that looking backward is just as important as trying to look forward with artificial intelligence, whatever that is. And I'm not sure I really understand it yet. But, you know, we have a lot of patients like that, that some of our old colleagues operated on and we have as well. Some of them succeed and some of them don't. I mean, it, it's it's just a lot of useful retrospective data that uh, we may be missing. I'm interested in your comments, Jens, about that. Why don't we look back, and, and Rick, why don't we look back as much as we try and look forward? Because we can't, we can't fast forward 10 years to the patients we operate on right now. Love it, uh, thank you. You've always had uh, a great uh, out of the box thoughts in many good ways and this is one of them. I mean, we should probably any deformity patient that we have somehow register them 
and see what worked well and what didn't work well. And again, in medicine, uh, always learning from our uh, great gains and uh, conversely learning from our mistakes is a big deal. And having this uh, registered, whether we did the surgery or somebody else did, shouldn't matter. So uh, we're heading probably more and more towards that uh, with some form of a registration process that is simplified, that does not have as much uh, uh, effort in terms of input points, but point well taken. Thank you. Pat, I would agree with you fully. I think we need to go uh, get as much data as we can looking backwards as well. This, this woman that you mentioned uh, is a remarkable story. I wish we could find more of them so that we can understand what the success, uh, what led to the success. Uh, to Rick's question about specifically about L5 versus S1 is one of uh, many questions we have in adult deformity. It's not, um, it's, a, it, it's why we're in this exciting field. It, it, there's, there's many unsolved problems. Stopping at L5 leads to a lot of concerns uh, related to failure at L5. Stopping at S1 leads to a lot of Are concern. Are out of time? Proximal junctional failure. Uh, so I think we have a lot to sort out. And there, are, uh, I want to underscore one other point. We, we use radiographic data a lot to help us make decisions. But it, it is likely not the radiographic data that leads us to success and failure. To some extent, it's radiographic data, but there are so many other factors that are not the radiographs. We should be spending our time understanding the patient, uh, the other patient uh, characteristics more. Yeah, those are all great comments. It was a good, good, good hour of Journal Club. I think we're coming to the end. Any other last uh, comments, questions? Great job, Utah. That was very, uh, very cool. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank, thank you, Linda, Alexis, and Ashley as well for uh, putting helping put this together. This is a great series. Uh, thank you. A lot of smart guys up. around the country. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Really appreciate you all being on. Yes, th this was terrific. And again, thanks to the to Alexis, to Linda, and Megan from uh, the Science Foundation that helped put it together. And this is terrific, and we'll keep on doing it. Thanks, everybody. Stay safe yeah. and healthy. Thank you. Thanks, well, guys. Have a nice weekend. Great job. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.